Okay, so, uh, well then, why don't we just get started again? Now, everybody has, you've seen and you've followed along so far with the call of Moses, the ten plagues, you know, why there are frogs and beetles and so on and so forth. Okay, you maybe learned that, that was new for you. And then, of course, you know, the crossing into the Red Sea, and now we are at Sinai. So you got that big picture now in your head, right? So everyone's with me? Great. What we're going to do now in part two is the establishment, but also the infraction of the covenant at Mount Sinai. Okay? Here's this great image I have here of Mount Sinai. You like that? It takes me a while to find these pictures, so I like, the, I like it when I hear the oohs and the ahs. It's great satisfaction. So, so now, we're at, now we're at chapter 19. Chapter 19 They've gone, through, they're, they're, they've gone south towards Sinai. They're being fed and sustained by manna, by flesh. By the way, that's no coincidence that they're being fled, fed by flesh and bread. You know, sort of, and Jesus unites them in the, uh, in the Last Supper. Just want to mention that, by the way. Uh, so now they're, they finally arrived at Mount Sinai. And when we, we read immediately, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, you see their vocation being more, it's elaborated a little bit more. This is what God has in plan, in store for the Israelites. He says, You have seen how I treated the Egyptians and how I bore you up on eagles' wings. That's where we get the song, by the way. Eagles' wings. And brought you to myself. I brought you to myself. Now, if you obey... By the way, it's not if you believe in my name as your personal Lord and Savior. He says, if you obey me completely, obey me completely, and you keep my covenant, you will be my treasured possession among all peoples, for the whole earth is mine. You will be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. This is Israel's vocation, Israel's call, Israel's mission. As a people, as a firstborn son of God, they will be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And again, by being a kingdom of priests, and priests are ones that serve, they would go out and evangelize all other nations and bring all other nations to the true God and to the covenant that God makes with Israel. That is, that's their role. That's their, that's their mission. And the catechism says as much as well. In the promise to Abraham and the oath that accompanied it, God commits himself, but without disclosing his name. So let's get a little bit of a follow-up with what we just discussed at the burning bush. He begins to reveal it to Moses and makes it known clearly before the eyes of the whole people when he saves them from the Egyptians, for he has triumphed gloriously. From the covenant of Mount Sinai onwards, this people is his own, and it is to be a holy or consecrated nation. Because it's the same word, holy consecrated nation, because the name of God dwells in it. They are holy because they belong to God. This is intimate family language here. This is what our religion is all about. Again, we're not Muslims. God is not our slave master. We're not his slaves. He is our father. We are his children. This is much more intimate than anything that anybody could ever have imagined. So this is their role. Now, Right after chapter 19, God gives, God gives Moses, reveals to Moses what's called the book of the covenant, the book of the law. Because Israel is going to love God by word, but also by deed. And they're going to be a holy nation. They're going to put away sin. And you only notice this is, you know, chapters 20 to 23. Only four chapters of the law. That's not very much. Because they must respond to God in love and righteous deeds of holiness. God says later in Leviticus, you must be holy because I'm holy. But he's got to teach his children how to be holy. Now, the first part of this book of the covenant is the Ten Commandments. We're going to spend a little time on the Ten Commandments. Now, it's really interesting. Uh, you joke a lot about how Catholics might not have read the book, but they've seen the movie. You know, um, But so God does give the commandments to to the Israelites. Why does he give God the commandments to the Israelites? Well, because he came first to the Germans. And he said, I've got commandments for you that's going to make your life better. And the German says, Was ist das? What are commandments? And the Lord said, Rules for living. So give me an example. Thou shalt not kill. They said, Danke, nein, not interested. So we went over to the Italians, said, I've got commandments. They also wanted an example. God said, Thou shalt not steal. 
Not steal? Grazie. No, we're not interested. Went over to the French. They also wanted an example. And he said, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. They said, no way, we're not interested. (laughs) Merci, no, merci, no. So they went over to the Americans. They too wanted an example. Because I got to pick on the Americans too, of course, you know. All right, honor the Sabbath. They're like, what? Go to church? But that's game day. No way, not interested. (laughs) Finally, he went to the Israelites. He's exhausted. He says, I've got commandments. And the Israelites say, commandments? How much are they? God said, they're free. Great, we'll take 10 of them. <laughs> uh, now, I found that. I found it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No, because they would have taken them. Right. The polls. Now, I found an abbreviated version of that on a Jewish website, so I can't get picked on. I picked on the Americans, too. So, But it's a funny joke, is it not? All right. We got a joke. We got a laugh. Because, when, again, you talk about some more difficult things, talk about morality, people get nervous. People don't want to talk about morality. Because what are the commandments, the rules of living that we might have today in our Western society? Don't offend anybody. You, gotta be, you can't be intolerant. You've got to be nice. These are our commandments nowadays. But God is revealing something so much more than that. Now, we're going to talk about the commandments God says, first and foremost, I am the Lord your God. You shall know the gods before me. This is the beginning of the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk and contextualize them and try to explain them, hopefully. I'll do my best to explain them in their greater context of the covenant. Now, before we move on, I couldn't resist this joke. Out of my cold, dead hand. So here's Charlton Heston holding his two towels. I just couldn't resist it. But now, naturally, he does give, you know. He doesn't have to die to give, <laughs> give the Israelites the, the two tablets, but there you go. So, let's spend a little bit of time just contextualizing these tablets, okay? These Ten Commandments. First and foremost, the, the whole book of the covenant with the commandments first, they are the terms of the covenant between God and Israel. The terms of the covenant. What does God promise Israel? To be a holy nation, to be a kingdom of priests. Now, that ain't no small promise. That's, that's, that's huge, now, what do they got to do? They got to live righteously. They got to be holy. So the, the book of the covenant and the Ten Commandments are the terms that they've got to honor. And the catechism says this very, very clearly. I'm not just making this stuff up, in other words. The ten words sum up and proclaim God's law. Paragraph 2058 goes on, uh, says, These words the Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud, and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more. This is Moses speaking in Deuteronomy. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone and gave them to me. So the catechism goes on. For this reason, these two tablets or tables are called the testimony. In fact, they they contain the terms of the covenant concluded between God and his people. These tables of the testimony were to be deposited in the ark. And they are later put into the ark with manna and with Aaron's rod, all pointing towards Christ. Again, that typology. So these are the terms of the covenant. covenant. They've got to give back. They've got to give something back to God, and that's righteous holiness living, a life of morality. The second thing to point out, as the catechism does a few paragraphs later, is that the commandments are a response of love to God in his covenant. They're a response to God in love, because God loved us first. So paragraphs 20, 61, and 62 say this. The commandments take on their full meaning. In other words, the commandments aren't just God up there saying, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The commandments have their full meaning within the covenant. Within God's attempt, his coming down to us to make us his people. According to scripture, man's moral life, our moral lives, has its meaning in and through the covenant. Because the first of the ten words recalls that God loved his people first. And the commandments, properly so called, come only in second place. They express the implications of belonging to God through the establishment of the covenant. We want to be a holy people because ultimately, in fulfillment in Christ, we are a holy people. We are a kingdom of priests. We want to be that. We want to have, take uh, benefit of his promises. Well, we've got to respond to him in love. And we respond with a moral life. Moral existence is a response to the Lord's loving initiative. It is the acknowledgement and homage given to God and a worship of thanksgiving. It is a cooperation with the plan God pursues in history. God just doesn't say, bam, 
There you are. You are a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and all you got to do is sit there. He says, no, in order to be a kingdom of priests and to be a holy nation, you must respond to the love that I show you, I've shown you first. Does that make sense? Because Catholicism is a big yes. The church's teachings on morality is a big yes. Do you want happiness? Do you want peace? Do you want fulfillment? Then follow the commandments of God as they are preserved, protected, and interpreted in the church. Even if they're difficult to understand, because I'll tell you what, we all have some sort of thing that just irks us. It could be anything. It could be women priests. It could be contraception. It could be gay marriage. It could be the Eucharist. It could be stem cell research. We've all got something that's difficult. It could be one thing. It could be many. I don't know. But the church is a big yes, saying if you want fulfillment, then follow these commandments that God has given to us because he loved us first. So when we respond to love, we will have fulfillment and happiness and we will be a holy nation. Does that make sense? All right. So having said that, then the catechism talks about the commandments in terms of what's called natural law. In other words, as it's going to explain the very last line here, the commandments are engraved by God on the human heart. When God created us, he created us for himself. We do not have happiness apart from him. So the commandments are something that's natural to every single person. You don't necessarily need divine revelation to know that stealing is bad, that lying is bad. You've got to be faithful to your spouse and so on and so forth. You've got to serve and worship God because that's just justice worshiping God. He created us, so it's just right and natural to worship him back, right? But because of sin, our intellects are darkened and our wills are weakened, God reveals the commandments to Israel. And this is um, what the catechism says. Because it's part of, it's written on our, our hearts, it's binding on everybody, everywhere. It says this, Since they express man's fundamental duties towards God and towards his neighbor, the Ten Commandments reveal in their primordial content grave obligations. Meaning this is grave matter here when we, when we transgress the commandments. It's not light. They are fundamentally immutable. And they oblige you always and everywhere no one can dispense from them. In other words, commandments 1 through 10, we'll talk about them right now, they are grave obligations. Lying, stealing, um, adultery, uh, honoring the father and mother, worshiping God, honor, honoring the Sabbath, so on and so forth. They're grave. If we transgress them, it ruins our relationship with God. Now, what were the, what were the uh, violations, the punishments for transgressing these 10 commandments in the Old Testament? death. You died. You were taken out. If you, if you were mowing your lawn on a Sabbath, now some of you just came back from Holy Land and they took this to incredibly awful extremes. All right. Now Jesus naturally had big problems with this. You couldn't take care of somebody in a hospital as someone was telling me earlier. Um, but in any case, if you're out working, they would take you out back and stone you. This physical death, although horrible, points towards something even worse. In the new law, in the new covenant, if you transgress these Ten Commandments, it points towards a spiritual death. Our union with God is destroyed if we do it willingly and forcefully. And this is why the church says, for example, in commandment number, uh, number three, honor the Sabbath, honor the Lord's Day. It's a grave obligation. We can at least give God one hour and certainly one day out of the week. To serve him. And that's why the church says if you purposefully miss Mass on Sundays, it's a grave sin. This is why. So even the church herself is not out there trying to, you know, whip us into shape. There's, it's all in the context of the covenant. God wants us to be his people, and so we must respond back and love him and give him what is due to him. We owe him worship and love for everything that he's given to us. And hasn't he blessed us? Can I hear an amen about that? Amen. He's blessed us tremendously, and so we can worship him back. So, that's enough of my uh, soapbox, all right? Let's look at the Ten Commandments themselves. Tablet 1 here, you might have known, contains the first three commandments because they refer to God. Tablet 2 contains the rest of the commandments because they refer to our neighbor. And they are fundamentally joined. You cannot love God and not love your neighbor. You cannot say, I love my neighbor, but yet not love God. You've got to do both. And isn't that what Jesus said? What are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
So that's why it's not enough for someone just to go to Mass, even every, every week or even every day, and then forget about their neighbor, the, the poor, the naked, the hungry. We've got to do that. It's an obligation for us. And it's not just enough to go out and serve in soup kitchens and then not go to Mass. We've got to do both together. Why? Because we'll be happier that way. And we will have great union with God that way. I had one foot on my soapbox again, but I, okay, I'm going to get off. So let's look at these three. I got them right here in your notes. The first commandment is that of against idolatry. No other gods before me. No graven images. Don't bow before them as gods. So time out. But you Catholics have graven images. Do you not? You have graven images, you idolaters. This is not, I'm, not, I'm just joking. All right. You're not idolaters. We're not, because I'm Catholic too. Last I checked. Now, God is saying don't make images to worship them. It's in the context of serving them, adoring them as false gods. Three chapters later, in chapter 25, he commands that Moses and, well, the people build, when they're building the Ark of the Covenant, what are the two images right on the mercy seat? Two cherubim. Last I heard, or last I, I knew, that was an image of something in heaven. Angels, right? So how can God forbid graven images in chapter 20 and then command that they construct graven images in chapter 25? Because the commandment is against idolatry, serving those images. So don't ever let a non-Catholic say statues are bad. You know, no, we're not worshiping the statues. They're simply images to remind us of our older brothers and sisters in the faith. In the faith. So if, if a non-Catholic says you worship these images, ask them, hey, can I see the uh, pictures in your wallet, please, of your family? And just shove them in their face and say, you are worshiping your family. You've got these images. No, don't do that. But you get the point. They're not worshiping the photos, nor, do the statues are, nor are the statues worshiped by us. All right, enough said. Commandment two is blasphemy. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Again, this is the holy name of God. The name that God just revealed to Moses and all the people. Don't take it in vain. Don't take false, false oaths. Don't speak about God without remembering his presence. We speak, speak about God, let's remember what he's done for us. Yes, it does refer to cussing, but in a minor sense. Primarily, it's about false oaths. Number three, it's irreligion. Honor the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is built into creation itself. We discussed that two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it was. God created the world in a covenant relationship with him. We were created for the Sabbath. If we do not worship God on the Sabbath, we remain on the day of the beast. What day is that? Six. The mark of the beast. So we're called for Sabbath worship. So um, transgressing that commandment is that of irreligion. We must worship God. It's due to him. That's why the church says go to Mass on Sunday. If you don't like the Mass at your parish, go to a different parish. Whatever it is, but go to Mass. Number, and then the rest. Four to, ta- four to ten is all about our neighbor. Honor, the father, honor your father and your mother. No matter what they've done to you, they've given you something that you can never repay. Which is what? Life. You can never repay them for that. So dis- you know, never, I mean, it's interesting. We can forgive anybody anything except for our parents, right? Because when our parents sin against us, it's like we hold on to it forever. Trust me. You know, I know many people, including myself, things are hard to forgive. But we've got to honor them. We've got to speak with respect and the dignity that's due to them, even if we disagree with on points. Number five, thou shalt not kill. Does that mean we can't have hamburgers? Does that mean we can't kill bunnies? Well, you sh- bunnies are cute, all right? But lamb, you can't have lamb chops. No, it's not referring to animals. It's only referring to humans. Let's get a little more specific. Does that mean the death penalty is wrong and we can't have just war? Big, that's a big topic. Suffice to say for now, the commandment is thou shalt not take innocent life. Thou shalt not take innocent life. If someone comes into my house and threatens my family and that I have to give a lethal blow to stop them, my intention is not to kill, first and foremost. It's called double effect, but we won't get into that. My intention is not to kill them. My intention is to stop them from harming me and my family. Am I breaking the commandment if I have to defend myself legitimately? No. It's taking innocent life. That's sort of a Pandora's box. I like just bringing up just difficult topics and moving right along. <laughs> Number five, and so on. Uh, sorry, uh, six, adultery, don't steal. It goes on and on. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. Don't cover your neighbor's goods. Fantastic. Now, what's interesting, did you know that the Protestant order of the commandments is different than the Catholics? They order it differently. Why is that? Yeah, quick comment. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. (laughs) 
Not out of shame, if that's what you're indicating. It's because we can't talk about everything. And they're self-explanatory, right? However, number eight, don't bear false witness. I mean, the scandal we talk, the gossip we talk. I mean, again, this is all to help us to be a holy nation, to be right with each other. I got to move on because uh, we still have to talk about the tabernacle, Sinai. Oh, my goodness. We got to move on. Okay, so really quickly, the Protestants order it, order it differently. What do they do? I have it right here in your notes. So they unite our ninth and tenth commandment. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife and goods into one commandment. Well, in the tradition of St. Augustine, we're Catholics say a man's wife is a little different than a man's goods. All right? So we divide them. Because a wife is equal to the husband. The goods belong to the husband. So we divide that. And we unite. what, uh, and, and so we divide that and they unite it. But then Protestant Christians um, divide our first commandment into two. They say, thou shalt have no other gods before me, number one. Then number two, they say, thou shalt not have any graven images. So Catholics unite that because it's talking about the same thing. Don't worship false gods. All right. So if you ever run into that in catechesis or whatever, that's why we divide them the way we do. Okay. So you satisfied about the Ten Commandments? All right. I always sort of reluctantly hate to bring up the t- t- tough topics, but it's important that we do. Now, Exodus chapter 24, we get to the covenant. The covenant is ratified at Mount Sinai. So here on the slide, I've got verses 4 through 6 of chapter 24. Then... Having sent young men of the Israelites to offer burnt offerings and sacrifice young bulls, again, the Egyptian gods, as a communion offering to the Lord, Moses took half of the blood and put it in large bowls. The other half he splashed, pardon me, the other half he splashed on the altar. Taking the book of the covenant, he read it aloud to the people who answered, all that the Lord has said, we will hear and we will do. They willingly gave in. They willingly sort of uh, cooperated with the covenant. So then Moses took the blood and he splashed it on the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So the book of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, has just been read out loud to the people, and they say, We will do it. And then they establish this covenant. I want to give you a quick reminder. How is a covenant sworn? And what is the significance of it? First and foremost, you've got two parties. And two parties are going to be made kinsmen. Two estranged parties, even like foreigners, that could be the case. In this case, you've got the people of Israel and God. They state the terms of the covenant. God gave his part, you will be a holy, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. And then their part is, we will serve you in holiness and in righteousness. We will follow the commandments and the book of the law. And then they swear to keep these terms. They have, a, they have this ritual sacrifice. Now, you remember Abraham divided the animals in two and spread them up, spread them side by side. They stood in the midst of, or at least Moses and God, and the image of the flaming torch passed through them saying, if I break the terms of this covenant, may I be like these animals right here in our midst. Because every covenant has the blessings. We've seen the blessings, but there are curses symbolized by that ritual. The ritual here is the blood. The altar represents God, so Moses sprinkles the blood On the altar, representing God. And then he also does the same thing with the people. Saying, you are united in a blood covenant. And you will have blessings and curses attached to it. So now God becomes their father. And Israel becomes God's firstborn son. They ratified that in a covenant. But it's not just enough to have the sacrifice and swear the the term, swear the oath. They have also have got to eat. So when we get to, we'll talk about the eating in just a second. Why sprinkling the blood? Well, I kind of already just mentioned this. Positively speaking, it marks the blood covenant between God and the people, right? Negatively speaking, it marks the solemn curse of disobedience. They willingly said, if we disobey, may this, you know, what happened to the animals happen to us. May our blood be spilled like these animals. Okay. So, as I said, it's not just enough to sacrifice and swear the oath. You've got to eat. And that's exactly what happens right afterwards. In verses 8 through 10, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they beheld the God of Israel. Under his feet there appeared to be like sapphire tile work, as clear as the sky itself. For those of you with me in my Revelation class, this should start to sound a little familiar. Yet he did not lay a hand on these chosen Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. This is the sacrificial meal taking place. Okay? 
Now, this is worship here. This whole thing that takes place is a liturgical worship. And God and Israel, represented by not just all the Israelites, but also represented by these elders, have union with each other. This is a liturgical worship on Mount Sinai. Everyone see that? This is, this is, this is huge. This is the fourth covenant of all of, script, of Scripture, of the Old Testament. We've seen already Adam. We've seen Noah, then Abraham, and now we've got Moses. Now, every time God expands his family, he's trying to make it bigger. He is making it bigger and bigger, ultimately to encompass, encompass and bring into his family all nations. What we see here now, the mediator is Moses. And the family is now one holy nation. Remember, it was one holy marriage. And it's right there on your chart. One holy marriage, one holy uh, family under Noah, one holy tribe under Abraham, and now under Moses. It's a holy nation. It's a nation of tribes. And the sign, of course, is the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. Okay? The, the, unlike circumcision was for Abraham, the rainbow was for Noah, and the Sabbath was for Adam. It's right there on the top of your chart if you forget it. This is the fourth covenant, and this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the first promise that God makes to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation, and I will give you the land. It starts with Moses, and it's completed with Joshua, and we'll talk about that after the new year. All right, you following so far? It's pretty exciting, huh? It's good to see the golden thread start to unravel. All right, hope some of you have goosebumps, because I do. Okay. Now, God just gave... The Israelites, the law, the book of the law, right? We just discussed that. But now you not only worship God with holy living, you worship him with liturgy. And that's what happens next. After 24, when the, when the covenant is established and they eat and drink, they worship God on Mount Sinai. Moses goes up and receives commandments, receives directions to build the tabernacle with everything inside of it. The Ark of the Covenant, the, um, the table, the bread of the presence, the candlesticks, all that stuff. And it is the, the image that he sees, the directions that he receives from God is an image, a replica of the heavenly temple. Okay? So chapters 25 to 31 is a very minute description of all of that stuff. Okay? It's a liturgical worship that's taking place now. Now, the tabernacle, here's an image of the tabernacle. Nice, beautiful image. All the tribes are ordered. If you go into Numbers, which we'll talk about next week, it describes all of that stuff. But here is an image of the exterior of the, of the temple, of the tabernacle, I'm sorry. And here's an image of the interior of the tabernacle. You might not see it too well because the type is quite small. But what you have here is the most exterior part is the outer court. The outer court. And then right here, you got this cross section. You see it? All right. Inside this cross section is what's called the holy place. And inside the holy place is the holy of holies. And that is where the ark is is held. Okay. Couldn't resist it. Indiana Jones. Couldn't do it. I just couldn't resist. Apparently, you can buy that. It's a 12-inch figure. Looks really nice. But, you know, that's where the ark is held in the holy of holies. Okay. That's the structure of the tabernacle, which will ultimately be the structure for the temple. And again, we'll discuss that when we come back after Advent. Now, what's interesting about this is that it represents, it resembles something. So we have this, you know, this uh, senorita asking, well, what does the tabernacle resemble? If you've been paying attention carefully, you might have already seen it. Look Look back at Mount Sinai. There are three degrees of intimacy Between God and the people. The first degree of intimacy is Moses. He speaks to God intimately face to face as a a man speaks to a friend. Beyond Moses, you've got the elders. They approach Sinai. They're able to eat and drink with God. Remember? Then the people remain at the bottom of the mountain. So you've got these three degrees of intimacy during this period of this covenantal worship on Mount Sinai. The tabernacle is a mini Mount Sinai. The three levels of intimacy are replicated in the, t- in the tabernacle. The Holy of Holies is approachable only by the high priest. Only the high priest can go inside. Then in the holy place, the rest of the elders can go inside there, the other priests. Then finally, the outer court is where the people stay. The tabernacle itself, ladies and gentlemen, is a mini portable Mount Sinai. 
the worship of God. So when the Israelites leave Mount Sinai, this, this worship, this covenant union that they just had, it is taken with them wherever they go in the wilderness. This worship, this intimacy with God is perpetuated in the tabernacle. That's pretty cool, huh? If you don't have goosebumps now, you don't have skin. Okay? But wait! Is there more? Yes, senorita, there is. There is. Not only does it resemble Mount Sinai, but it resembles the Garden of Eden. Because in the Garden of Eden, man, Adam, was created to serve and love God as a royal priest. Remember we discussed that a little bit? He's, the whole language of till and serve the garden, of serving, avad is the same word, and protect the garden, is liturgical worship that Adam was supposed to perform in the Garden of Eden. So the Garden of Eden was a holy of holies in the earth that was the rest of the holy place and the rest of the outer court. And we see the symbolism take place. And God said, that expression, and God said, is found seven times in Genesis 1 through 2. The same amount of times it's found in the description of the tabernacle. The precious stones, you go back and read Genesis chapter 2, the precious stones being described in the Garden of Eden is also found throughout all the liturgical decorations in the, in the tabernacle. And number three, the two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. The only other time two cherubim are mentioned is when they are cast out of the Garden of Eden and two cherubim protect this inner sanctum. You see that? The tabernacle is trying to bring about a new creation. It's trying to restore the intimacy that Adam and Eve originally had with God in the garden. And now God is trying to gradually bring it back. All right? Another goosebump moment. This is, I mean, you, you read these chapters like, oh my goodness, this is so boring. But then you, get, you begin to see what God is doing slowly, gradually. That's pretty cool. Now, unfortunately, all right, unfortunately, just like Adam fell, so too did Israel. All right, Adam falls in the garden. Now Israel is going to fall at Sinai as well. We've got to move on to the golden calf. And this is chapter 32, okay? Everyone with me so far? All right, fantastic. I'm not being dyslexic and mixing up my words. I get, get all excited and I start saying, instead of Egyptians, I say Israelites. Instead of Israelites, I say Egyptians. So hopefully you're following me. Yeah, all right. So chapter 32, Israel now breaks the covenant. Let's read verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said, Up. So they say to Aaron, Jump. And he says, Well, how high? He practically does. Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses dude who brought us out of the land of Egypt, notice it's not God, but it's Moses who brought them out of Egypt. We don't know what happened to him. He's now on their milk bottles. He's gone. He's missing, missing in action. He's disappeared. Now Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold, which are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now, what's happening is Aaron, he's kind of cowardly. The people rise up and say, build us this calf. He says, okay, but it'll be a feast to the Yahweh. So it's this syncretism. Syncretism means um, sort of the blending of religions. You know, unfortunately, that happens even in the Catholic Church. The blending of New Age, of Eastern religions, and all this stuff. Aaron is, is doing the exact same thing. What is the bull? It's that Egyptian god Apis. Let's read on really quickly. Um, Verse 6, they rose up the next day, offered burnt offerings to it, brought peace offerings, and they rose up to play. They rose up to play. What's happening here is the bull and the golden bull represent power, wealth, and pleasure. They were worshiping in the bull, power, wealth, and pleasure. The bull represents power, of course. I mean, the bullfighting, even the Spanish recognize that. All right. The gold is the wealth. And rising up to play is an idiom. It's a sexual idiom referring to the cultic orgy sacrifices that the ancient world participated in. So they offered sacrifices to this false god, engaged in all kinds of immoral behavior, worshiping power, sex, uh, power, wealth, and pleasure. It's a good thing we don't do that anymore, right? Boy, we've learned our lesson. No one worships power, wealth, or pleasure anymore. 
We've learned our lesson, so that's good. I'm glad about that. So, immediately after this, Moses is still up on the mountain, and God says, go down at once, because your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, it's almost like they're married, right? It's your child, all right? Your child got peanut butter all over the couch. (sighs) Have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from the way I commanded them, making for themselves a molten calf and bowing down to it sacrificing to it and crying out, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. So very quickly, not a month goes by, and they turn away from him. So quickly. All right? Now, what you keep reading here in chapter 32, God offers Moses an incredible deal. All right? Basically, what he says in verses 11 and following, uh, I'm sorry, verses 7 and following, Up to 10, God says to Moses, step aside, let me consume them in my wrath, and I'm going to start over with you. All right, verse 10. That's what he says in verse 10. I will make of you a great nation. This is is quite a a big deal for Moses, right? You're going to start over with me? Yeah, let those suckers have it. Get them, get them. That's not what he says. Following in verse 11, he appeals to God and says, don't do it. I don't want it. Remember the covenant that you swore to Abraham. And in verse 14, the Lord repented of the evil. Now, does this mean that God is fickle? God is planning on just letting him have it because they justly deserve it, right? Does not the blood on the altar and the people resemble the curses that they willingly accepted? Now, when God is talking to Moses in this way, and he continues to do so throughout 33 as well, he's talking in in this way to allow Moses to rise up and be a much better intercessor. To humbly let, just let this blessing pass by and say, no, God, remember your covenant. Does God not remember his covenant? No, he does. That's why he made this promise to Abraham and elevated those promises to oaths. There'll be a great nation. Kings will come forth from him and they will be a worldwide blessing. God knows what they were going to do right there in, Genesis, in uh, Exodus 32. But now God is allowing Moses, for his own benefit, to be a true intercessor and to be a selfless mediator between God and the people. It's all for Moses' benefit. God knows what he's already going to do. So this takes place, and Moses comes right back down, down the mountain. All right? And we read chapter 32 still, verse 32. Oh, I'm sorry. Moses comes down. He drew near the camp. He saw the calf and all the dancing. He saw the immorality and he burned with anger and he threw down these, these tablets. Because why? Well, they've already broken the commandments. He is just showing them physically what they've already done spiritually. Okay? They've already infringed upon the covenant. He takes the calf, grind, grinds it down to dust and makes them drink it. <laughs> he makes them drink the object of their own adoration. Then he walks over to, to Aaron. He says, Aaron, what's up, buddy? I left you behind. What's going on? And and Aaron says, "Uh, don't let my Lord be angry. You know how the people are prone to evil. They said to me, make us a God. As for this man, Moses, we don't know what happened to him. So I said, whoever's wearing gold, take it off. They gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and out popped this calf. It's like, did Moses, I mean, seriously, is Moses really going to believe that? I mean, a few verses before, Uh, Let's see here. In verse 4, it said that he took a graving tool and made it. I mean, come on. He knows he's in trouble, as this little cartoon attempts to show. Aaron attempts to hide the calf, all right, from Moses. Quite embarrassed, he knows he's in trouble. All right, so he responds in a very pathetic way. He passes the buck, well, which isn't surprising, I suppose, knowing our sinful humanity. And then what Moses says next is... Is this. Moses stood at the gate of the camp. This is verses 26 to 29. He shouted, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. And he said, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, each of you put your sword on your hip. Go back and forth throughout the camp from gate to gate and kill your brothers, your friends and your neighbors. The Levites did as Moses has commanded. And at that day, about 3000 fell. And Moses said, You guys took my words way too far. Come on. He says, no. Today you have ordained yourselves as priests for the Lord. For you went against your own sons and brothers to bring a blessing upon yourselves this day. 
the Levites executed the curse of the covenant. The curse that they brought upon themselves. Presumably, scholars are saying, these 3,000 men are the ones who were originally the priests, the firstborns, the fathers and the firstborn sons, who led the people into this idolatry. So that's why it's only 3,000 of them. But they bring upon themselves the curse. They, they justly deserve... I mean, a month before they said that they would, they would follow everything, and they've already fallen away. Okay? And the Levites do this. They kill everybody. And what's interesting, you keep reading on, the Lord sent, in verse 35, the Lord sent a plague on the people. <laughs> Who did he just send plagues to against? The Egyptians. But now because of Israelites' disobedience, he sends a plague upon them. Interesting role reversal, is it not? Now, this is extremely important, ladies and gentlemen. We ha- Ch- Exodus 32 changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. As Calvin demonstrates right there, okay? Number one, there's a new priesthood. Remember, the priesthood was meant to be for all the tribes of Israel. Every firstborn son in every tribe would be a priest to the Lord. But now they've just been laicized. They've been defrocked. Now it will only be the Levites that will serve. Pardon me. It will only be the Levites that will serve the Lord. The rest of them have just been, they've lost their most intimate service to God. Number two, there are going to be a lot more sacrifices from this point on. And the sacrifice, it's not because God is, you know, bloodthirsty. He's like, you know what? He wakes up in the morning, as we kind of desire coffee. He's like, I would love a nice hot cup of goat's blood. That sounds delicious. <laughs> no, absolutely not. God commands the sacrifices. Why? To cause Israel to repudiate, to make Israel repudiate their idolatry. You want to worship a bull? Well, then you're going to have to sa- sacrifice a bull every single day. God is not thirsty for blood. He doesn't love the, the, the sacrifice of the animals. He's doing it for Israel's sake. This is why the Old Testament has all these sacrifices. Does it help explain things? They got to repudiate and 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 forego the gods they were worshiping in Israel in, in Egypt. Okay, number three, more laws come uh, are, are are added to the people. Before it was just four chapters. Remember, now they've got a total of six hundred and thirteen laws. <laughs> Why? Well, because as we're going to read next week, they keep disobeying, and God has to keep giving them more laws to help guide them, direct them. Laws are there for our benefit to be holy as they realize. So here we're going to take, well, one last point. The the importance of Exodus 32 is this. What the fruit was to Adam and Eve, the golden calf is to Israel. They were brought into this, Adam was created with this intimacy and this union with God, and they let go, through their disobedience, they went, well, down the wrong path. They lost it, right? Same thing with them. They brought, were brought into intimate union and communion with God, and through their disobedience, they lost it. So this is just as important as the fall in the Garden of Eden. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where the book of Leviticus comes in. Okay? So the Levites here now are made priests to the Lord. The book of Leviticus is the handbook for priests. The first half is the commands for worshiping in the tabernacle, all the different duties they're going to have inside. Chapters 1 through 16. Chapter 17 to the end of Leviticus is the material, the lessons that the Levites are going to use to teach the rest of the tribes. So this is why if you try to read cover to cover and you get to Leviticus, you're starting to think, oh my goodness, I do not like scripture anymore. How boring. Talking about entrails and and, um, fluids, you know, escaping all kinds of orifices of the body. It's all disgusting stuff. But the book of Leviticus itself has its origin right here. If It's very easy to presume that, and to to conclude, that if the Israelites did not worship the golden calf, there never would have been a book of Leviticus. It would have only been the book of the covenant, those four chapters long. And those are pretty basic laws. You go back and read. Does that make sense now, how the book of Leviticus fits into the story of salvation? God's plan of salvation? All right, great. Now, here we are. We're reaching... We're reaching our conclusion. The Israelites are given a second chance. They certainly repent of their deeds. 
Moses intercedes. We can't get into the details, but Moses intercedes even at great cost to himself. But they are given a second chance. They're able to renew the covenant once again. It's slightly different. More laws are added because of their disobedience and their idolatry. But they are given the second chance. They are restored. Just like Adam is promised restoration in Genesis 3.15, so now the Israelites are promised restoration as well. So the rest of the uh, book of Exodus here, from, uh, let's see here, 34 and 35, all the way to the end, to chapter 40, Moses and the Israelites, they basically build this tabernacle and all the furnishings inside of it. And at the end, in chapter 40, verses 34 to 35, the glory of the Lord, seen in this Shekinah glory cloud, representing the Holy Spirit, the glory of the Lord comes down and fills the tabernacle. And here is the verse. Then the Lord covered, or other translations say, the Lord overshadowed the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled down upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, what's interesting about... So this is pretty much the end of Exodus here. They, the whole people remain at the, at the foot of the mountain, at Mount Sinai, for a year. And we're going to pick up the rest of the story when we come back next week. Their wanderings in the desert to just about when they reach the promised land. But I want to point out one thing before we conclude, and that is this expression, the cloud, the Shekinah, overshadowed the tent. That is the exact same expression of when the Holy Spirit will overshadow Mary. Exact same expression. And the Greek, the Greek term is identical. So it's the Holy Spirit overshadowing, filling up Mary entirely. Entirely. And thus, Jesus Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Again, typology. All right, typology. So, that concludes this, this second period. Egypt and the Exodus. The people of Israel... Are, um, are at the foot of the mountain. Next, week, next week's our last session for the fall series. Remember, five in the fall, five in the winter, then five in the spring. L- uh, lesson five is the wanderings in the desert. We're going to look at numbers, and we're going to contextualize Deuteronomy rather quickly, and we're going to conclude. So I hope to see everybody here, because it's going to be some good stuff. It's going to be kind of frustrating. You know, you read, you read how Israel responds to God's love, and you just kind of want to smack them over the head. And God does worse, as a matter of fact. So I hope to see all of you there. We've got 10 minutes. If anyone needs to leave, by all means. If anyone has any questions, comments, observations, now is the time.